and welcome once again to another edition of the motoring programme Four Wheels Good, the only motoring programme that's on your screen each and every week. Well, later on in the programme, we'll be pitting two luxury cars against each other, the established Mercedes S-Class and the Japanese-made pretender to the throne, the Lexus LS400. Mike Rutherford's here later, interviewing our old friend Sterling Moss on the latest news from the world of Grand Prix. But the first half of the programme is dedicated to the new Jeep Wrangler and Chrysler Cherokee, which were being unveiled for the world's press on the Mediterranean island of Cyprus. Jimmy Buckley was there to report for Granada Meta Motors. This is the original Jeep, as featured in every single black and white war film you've ever seen. But it still has incredible street cred, and it's certainly the off-roader to be seen in in the 90s. The Jeep Wrangler can trace its roots back to the original US Army vehicles of the 50s, and its tough looks and fantastic cross-country handling have given it a legion of dedicated followers. It's become something of an icon, and only the very brave or the very foolish try to change an icon. The first thing that you notice about the 97 Wrangler is the fact that it's almost a return to the retro looks and the styling of the old Wranglers that everybody lo loves so much and of course the round headlamps are back. Yes they are indeed, yes. yeah. The um, round headlights uh, were on the original Willis Jeep of the 1940s and stayed on some of the CJ, the civilian Jeep series, right up until uh, the 80s when the last Wrangler was introduced with square headlights. and. And they didn't like it, did they, the purists? They did not, no, no. Some of them in the States um, started wearing T-shirts that said um, real Wranglers don't have square headlights. So um, we've just produced some, uh, some T-shirts recently that now say that uh, real Wranglers have round headlights. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but apart from the obvious changes, which are the external changes to the vehicle, there's not an awful lot remains of the previous Wrangler, is there? Is it 77% of this vehicle is completely new? Yes, yeah, 77% of the vehicle is new, but... Um, uh, as far as the, what you see on the vehicle from the exterior, only the doors and the tailgate uh, remain. So um, looking at it outside, um, you would, I think it's fair to say that it's, it's an all-new vehicle. Uh, there's quite a lot under the skin that's changed. The bits that have been retained are um, items that you wouldn't really notice, which, bits of, of metal work that are hidden under the body. So, but really everything you can see inside, outside and more or less underneath is new. So what's, what benefit is this to the vehicle? What are the improvements? Well, the, the, the most obvious improvement on the road has to be the introduction of coil spring sus suspension, very mm -hmm. similar to that used on the larger Grand Cherokee. Uh, that certainly improves ride quality and handling. Um, I know that the old vehicle was criticised uh, for being, at times, a little bit of a bone shaker, but this one certainly doesn't have um, any of that. Um, I think also it is a, um, a better looking vehicle because um, the windscreen here is uh, more sloping so it's a little bit more aerodynamic. Uh, the round headlights um, take a little bit of getting used to at first but um, uh, having uh, now been used to them, I've been here for, for two weeks um, looking at them every day and I just think it is so much, uh, so much better. It's a better headlight as well because it's bigger. Um, the interior where we're sitting here is much more modern. Uh, we now have uh, driver and passenger airbags. Uh, we have um, a modular dashboard uh, which allows um, both left-hand drive and right-hand drive to be built at the factory. But also it, it's, it's much more practical, it's more car-like. Um, uh, the old Wrangler had lots of sort of exposed bits and pieces inside. It, it, it had that sort of thrown together look, which some people like. But I think for everyday use, this more modern dashboard uh, and interior is, is, is uh, much more uh, practical and easier to live with. In the past, Chrysler were limited to selling only 500 Jeeps a year in the UK, as they had to be converted over here, and this also meant that the margins were tight. Jeep 97 is now factory produced in right-hand drive, and because of this, you can expect them to be cheaper. The range starts with a 2.5 litre sport version, which at £13,995 is £455 less than it was last time around. Also included is a 4-litre Sport at 15495 And if you want a little bit of luxury in your Jeep, then why not opt for the Sahara model? This comes with glass side and rear windows, a heated rear window and also a standard, a removable hard top. There are two versions in the Sahara range, a 4-litre at £17,650 and an automatic version at just over £18,000. There's a very comprehensive range on offer, so which model do Chrysler think they'll sell most of? I think the 2.5 Sport being very price competitive, 13995 is, is a good price for a, for a four-wheel drive. Um, it's not just a four-wheel drive, it's a Jeep, it's the real thing. 
Um, it's the most affordable Jeep in, in Britain. Uh, it's, it's, I suppose you could say it's our entry level model. And um, I think that's going to prove very popular. Um, but then again, there are those people that um, uh, buy the, the Wrangler, tend to be people who have quite a bit of spare money. It sometimes is a second or even third vehicle. And uh, they just want all the extras. And uh, they, they pile it all on and uh, go for the Sahara top of the range. So, but I, I think uh, 2.5 Sport is, is going to be one of our more popular models. The 97 Jeep Wrangler is very much about old-fashioned style and charm combined with modern refinements. The cabin certainly offers far more comfort this time around, not so much more room, particularly with the rear bench seats, which now has an extra 20 centimetres of width. There's a new lockable glove box for improved safety, and twin airbags come as standard. But you'll be happy to know that it's still as practical as ever. After a muddy day out off-roading, there's no problem. The electronic units and seat fabrics on the Jeep are water resistant. All you need to do is take out the carpets, pull out the floor pan plugs, and you're away. Just hose the thing out and clean it down. Let's not forget, of course, that part of the fun of owning a Jeep isn't just for posing around town in it. A Jeep really comes into its own when you get it off-road. Jeep can certainly deliver the goods when it comes to off-roading. In fact, these things can probably get you to places that you don't want to go to at all. If a Jeep can't take you there, then you ought to think twice about going, was their advertising slogan of the 70s. So I think it's time to test out the latest American dream and see how it copes with the rough and rugged terrain of Cyprus. Ginny Buckley there with the first of her reports from Cyprus. It would make a story itself on how a major press launch like this comes together. Many of the vehicles had only just been manufactured in America and had to be flown in and not shipped over as is usual at a huge extra charge. And then Cyprus Customs impounded the vehicles and only released them just hours before the first journalists arrived with the Chrysler team getting more and more agitated. And also the 4x4 course had to be worked out from a combination of rare maps as a detailed roadmap of southern Cyprus doesn't actually exist in case it falls into the hands of the Turks who occupy the north. Well still all these problems were overcome and a successful international press launch did take place. After the break Ginny continues her report on the new Chrysler Cherokee and Jeep Wrangler. Hi, welcome back to Four Wheels Good and a special edition featuring Ginny Buckley's exploits in Cyprus for the international press launch of the new Chrysler Cherokee and the Jeep Wrangler. There's an incredible amount of hard work that goes into the production of any new vehicle. And that work doesn't necessarily end once it finally rolls off the manufacturer's production line. That's because a new model has to sell to make sure that all that investment in it pays off. And that's where promotion comes in letting the general public know about it, making them aware of it, so that they'll go out and buy it, hopefully in droves. And apart from advertising, the main way of doing that is getting journalists to drive your new vehicle and hopefully fill their magazines, newspapers and programmes with reviews telling people how well the vehicle looks, how it performs and how fantastic it feels. So when you're launching not one, but two new vehicles, that are really at their best in an off-road condition, you have to do some serious thinking about where you're going to hold that launch, which is what Chrysler did when they chose to launch the new Jeep Wrangler and the Jeep Cherokee in Cyprus. Well, we probably started planning this event about a year ago um, when we first hatched the idea to come to Cyprus. And over 
the past 12 months we've been working away. Um, it so, sort of accelerates in the last three or four months, but uh, really a, a good 12 months of planning to sort an event like this out. If organising a foreign holiday is one of the most stressful things you can do, imagine the stress involved in organising trips for journalists from all over the UK and getting them out of their offices to wart on Cyprus, all in one piece. And then having a fleet of your latest vehicles in perfect working order, waiting for them to test. The whole thing has to be organised like a military operation, with nothing at all left to chance. There's a huge team involved in making sure that the event runs smoothly and for them it starts at the crack of dawn, preparing the vehicles for a day of off-roading. Morning ladies and gentlemen. Trust you all slept well. You're ready for your uh, adventure today. As I said yesterday, we've got 130 uh, miles to do. Um, and that's about six hours driving, eight hours to do it in because obviously most of you are away tonight. Remember that we're here to give you instruction and I've got um, a group of very experienced off-roaders behind me um, and they are there to help you if you've got any questions and whatever, whatever you want about the vehicles, so please bear that in mind. So with a bit of advice from an expert, off we went for our day of off-roading. But Chrysler didn't want to leave anything to chance. I mean, journalists in Cyprus? Who knows what could happen? So, they provided us with a very detailed route plan, giving us directions every step of the way. So no excuses for anybody getting lost. We're now on to much rougher roads and gravel roads for uh, pretty much the next three hours. I'll be uh, gibbering at you all the time over the radio, uh, giving you various pointers, um, giving you some information about what we've got here because we're going to head down onto the old Venetian trading route which used to bring copper from the Paphos uh, High Trudis Mountains down to the port of Paphos. Okay, so this is, the, this is a real nice bit of the route so let's go out and enjoy it. By mid-morning we were in the middle of the Cypriot Mountains, but we still managed to find time to have a break for some tea and coffee. Well we've made it through the mountains so far and we're in the abandoned village of Fretcher and with me here is George, one of the support crew, wearing one of these fantastic t-shirts. Now there's a story behind these t-shirts. Um, real Jeep aficionados in America love their Jeep so much that on the last model Wrangler when they changed them to the square headlamps they made these t-shirts with real wranglers have round headlamps. Well they'll all be happy to know that the round headlamps are back 
And what about this one? Real men drive Jeeps. What do you think about this, George? Yeah. Is this what real men drive Jeeps? I think real women have to drive Jeeps as well. <laughs> they actually. do, they do. Where are we, George, in this? What, what's the story behind this village? This uh, was a Turkish Cypriot village here. Um, and around 1974, the, uh, the troubles were so bad that the inhabitants of this village decided it was time to go to the Turkish side. Um, so they all up stakes and off. And we're and left now with some empty shells, yeah. There's just part from a few goats and us coming through. You've been organising um, the trips of journalists coming through. Has it been a tough job? Has it been hard work? It, it's been an enjoyable job. Um, it certainly has been tough. The hours have been long. Um, we have to look after the cars. We have to make sure that they're all clean for the next day. All pristine so that you can, uh, you can photograph yeah. them, have filmed them. And uh, basically everyone has a nice clean car when they come out in the mornings. Yeah, George is looking forward to his Easter break because when everybody has been sort of lying in bed in the morning nursing their hangovers, poor George and the support crew have been up at six cleaning the vehicles, getting them ready for everybody. We've done a fantastic job because they seem to be holding up so far extremely well. We've had no problems whatsoever other than a few punctures, which is uh, only to be expected when... Uh, when a bunch of erratic journalists, loose, yeah, yeah let loose let on loose it. <laughs> Well, the vehicle we've been trying out this morning is the two and a half litre petrol version, which is the entry level model. And it's time to upgrade for the next leg of the journey to the top of the range, the four litre automatic. Make life a bit simpler, I think. Our schedule for the day's events had told us that there would be a lunch stop and we all imagined a picnic, but not a picnic quite like this. There in a clearing in the middle of the forest were tables and chairs, waiters in white suits, cups of coffee, wine glasses and even flowers on the table for us all. And while we tucked into the wonderful food, our vehicles were lined up and waiting, ready for the next leg of the journey. When we first came through here, we'd actually uh, were on the off-road course, and we uh, came over the hill behind us, just up here, and uh, drove straight past on the road up there, and uh, looked down to the left and thought, "Ah, this is this looks interesting. It's a potential lunch stop." And then we had to then think about how we could make it work. And the only way we could make something like this work was to uh, ship in the caterers. And so. Um, uh, it seemed like a crazy idea at the time, but um, uh, our ground agents here in Cyprus said, um, yeah, we can do it, and the hotel were more than uh, willing to do it. Obviously, this is different to what they do down at the hotel. It's, um, mm. They enjoy coming up here and uh, cooking out in the open, and uh, we said, yep, yeah, let's try it. And um, uh, it's quite wild, quite uh, unusual, but uh, we said, let's go for it. It's a lovely contrast to the kind of rough and tumble, uh, you know, out there in the off-roaders, and then suddenly there's mm. this little bit of luxury. It's very yeah. nice. That's it's a little twist in the tail. So many um, manufacturers, you're not the only one. Launches are always for new products, are always abroad in some sort of exotic location, yes. some sunny place, well, mm -hmm. sunny place, but it's not very sunny here today. Mm -hmm. Why is that? What, why not just get people down to the office in Dover and show well, them a load of vehicles there? I think the, th the thing is there's a lot of competition in um, the British motor industry now. It's probably not just the British motor industry, the world motor mm. industry, to attract um, a small number of motoring journalists to their event. Um, uh, that uh, involves, uh, you, you have to really put together an event where um, you can attract them not just because there, there's great accommodation or there's great food, but there's also great driving. 
It also helps if the weather's nice um, because uh, nobody likes driving in snow if um, they don't have to. Um, nobody likes driving in pouring rain or in fog or grey, miserable weather. Um, if the sun's shining, um, it tends to uh, lift an event. It tends to lift everybody's spirits and mm. everyone feels good. Um, and I think also is that um, there are some manufacturers who organise events where they bring in people from other countries. And it's not everybody wants to come to Britain for, event, for an mm. event. For example, on this event here in Cyprus, although it's organised by uh, the UK arm of uh, Chrysler Jeep, we have invited South Africans and Japanese to it, and um, uh, bringing them to Cyprus, uh, I think, was quite attractive. They, they liked the idea. I, mean, I suppose you get some nice pictures out of it in the sunshine as well, mm -hmm. presumably. Yeah. And also having seen the vehicles today in this kind of situation, which you wouldn't really get maybe in the mm -hmm. UK, mm -hmm. they really do look at home and you can really see how they perform, so mm -hmm. there must be a degree of that as well. There is, yes. Yeah, the thing about Cyprus is that um, it allows us to do six, seven hours off-roading in a day and travelling a great distance. In the UK, the, the events tend to, when they're off-road, tend to be in a field or in a quarry, in a very small area. And that's great for a, for a short event, but um, for something like this where we want people to drive for, for many hours in the car, um, we had to have the right sort of, um, uh, of, of off-road conditions, and we found mm. them here in Cyprus. Um, another reason why we came here as well is because um, it is a right-hand drive market, for, for it, and, and for us that's, that's perfect because we are selling right-hand drive cars. The attention to detail is incredible. Just tell, talk me through some of the little sort of touches that you've put to it. I noticed the Jeep soap, and that's a very nice oh, one. Oh, yes, yeah. Well, when, when we came out here to, do, to um, check out the location, I noticed in the hotel room there was a, a bar of soap with the, um, the name of the hotel imprinted in it. And I thought, well, if they can do it for the name of the hotel, surely they can do it for Jeep. So we spoke to the hotel and said, yeah, let's do it. And so we've placed those bars of soap in the hotel, in all the washrooms at the places that are believe it or not, toilets and washrooms here, so we put them in here. There are toilets and washrooms here, definitely, yes. with towels <laughs> and soap. It's yes, much needed. And a very clean <laughs> toilet. Oh, is that, oh, right, okay. I haven't been in the ladies, so I wouldn't know. It's but, very uh, clean. Yeah, yeah. The gents aren't too bad either. But, um, uh, but th there are little touches like that that we, um, uh, we, we, we like to put into the event. Uh, when you've planned something like this and you spend the best part of a year of your life organising it, it's a shame to let the event down by missing out on the fine touches. Um, you probably noticed in the vehicle this, this, this morning we had bottles of water and we had um, little sweets um, and yeah. packets of chewing gum and that sort of thing. Uh, on the off-road section, we made sure that everybody could stay in touch by using CB radio. Um, not the easiest thing to use in Cyprus because CB radio isn't legal here and we had to get p special permission to use the CB radios. Um, we, um, we, we have all little touches like that and I think it just adds to the event. Um, uh, anybody can organise a driving event but, but a smoothly run professionally organised event is, is, um, is, is quite difficult and um, takes a lot of time and effort and hopefully we succeeded. And before you know it, just as if nothing's ever happened, they're clearing up and they're away and it's back to normal again. Never be the same again in this forest, I'm sure. This is Duncan Barber who specialises in high-speed off-road camera tracking and he's been giving us a few tips today. But Duncan is also responsible for setting up this incredible off-road course that we've been experiencing. What makes a good off-road course, do you think, Duncan? Um, first of all, you've got to make it suit the vehicle in some respects. I mean, we've gone out here and uh, looked for areas where we can actually let the vehicle have its head, so to speak, um, and areas where we're able to take it into an off-road situation um, and be able to show the journalist what exactly it can do. Um, you've really, we also want to make it more of a, a travelogue thing. It's got to be a bit of an adventure out there, uh, not just a four-wheel drive course. I mean, obviously that has its, uh, its uses because you want to be able to see how the vehicle works, but pretty much most of the people who have been on this event have actually taken these into serious off-road off conditions. Here we wanted them to actually experience the vehicle in a different way, and I think we've managed to do that. Well, sadly, our day of off-roading fun has come to an end. And, you know, I think it's kind of strange that a group of vehicles that started off as war vehicles of the 1940s have ended up fighting a sales war in the 1990s. But the Jeep Wranglers are definitely fit and fully prepared to do battle. The new coil spring suspension has dramatically increased the handling and the off-road capabilities. And when you combine that with these rugged American looks and the fact that they're so much fun to drive, I think Jeep have got a vehicle that's prepared to not only win the battle, but to win the war as well. 
Well, Ginny will be back again next week talking to Mike Rutherford about his recent visit to the San Diego Motor Show. We're back on home ground after the break with two luxury cruisers compared by Nicky Fox and Eamon O'Neill, which is really worth what is considered by most to be a king's ransom, the Mercedes S-Class or the Lexus LS400. Find out after the break. Hi, welcome back to Four Wheels Good here on the Granada Men and Motors channel. Well, not many of us can afford a truly luxurious car, but we can all dream. Assume you have the cash to go out and buy a brand new Lexus LS400 or Mercedes S-Class. Which would it be? What a choice. Meet two luxury cars for the managing classes. Those are people who require, and I quote, above average stress relief from their motors. This is a Lexus LS400. Company motto, the relentless pursuit of perfection. And this is a Mercedes-Benz S320. They claim the S-Class redefines the classic top-class saloon. Accountants concentrate if you wish to acquire this property. The Lexus costs £46,425 and boasts of being a complete package. Mercedes has a basic price of 49625 with a range of optional extras that should keep the boardroom busy for a week. Let's put the price into perspective. The chairman's executive Range Rover would cost £47,500. How would your workforce feel about the image? Two views possible, I suppose. Purposeful and understated, or just big and dull. Big, certainly. Should you wish to dispose of the dead donkey, both boots are more than adequate. But if you want to take three of your colleagues for a ride, put the ones you don't like in the back, or go for the limo version at well over £51,000. Although the Lexus is smaller on the outside, it's bigger on the inside. Lexus was formed in 1983 as something more than a luxury division of Toyota. It's well built. When the original 400 was introduced in 1989, the Americans went wild. The only change they wanted was gold badging front and rear. Seems they don't like their understatement quite as discreet as we do. Mercedes-Benz have been making cars for over 100 years, so they have got a few things right, including the double glazing. Now, I wonder who sold them that. Their options list is always astounding, and you can now buy a motorised door closing aid. It's a shame that what would be a boon for many a disabled driver will only be enjoyed by those who think, how much should I pay myself this week? Don't let anyone take your executive parking spot because big cars like these can be a nightmare to manoeuvre in confined spaces. You just can't see your corners. But if you can find another £775.21, pence, Mercedes will sell you their Parktronic system so you can see and hear just how close that repair bill's getting. Still, it pays to be careful. Mercedes advises you to keep these little sensors free of road dirt and slush to be sure they're telling the truth. The Lexus has 4 litres, the Mercedes 3.2. But when all said and done, both cars are indecently quick. 0-60 in less than 9 very quiet seconds. The handling is surprisingly impressive and the top speeds are best explored on a racetrack. The Lexus LS400 is a lovely luxury car, but it's lost something in the relentless pursuit of perfection. The pursuit of some more personality for the car would help, because I sit here gazing dispassionately at peripheral things like the cup holders and the ritzy instrumentation and feeling that somehow the sum of all these beautifully made parts doesn't quite add up to the price tag. The more I drive this, the more I realise that Mercedes-Benz do give you a lot for your money with the S-Class. You get five speeds, safety, silence and smoothness. And you can really start to enjoy the fact that a lot of thought has gone into the engineering, the design and the layout. Sounds pretentious? No, it's just clinically satisfying. At these luxury levels of outlay, I feel entitled to nitpick. Yes, the gearbox and engine are beautifully smooth, but you feel the worst of the potholes in the road. And it takes very careful pedal pressure to keep it going smoothly in traffic. And there is a whisper of wind noise at higher speeds, so it isn't perfect, but it does encourage you to drive in a very calm and relaxed manner. Well, OK, the sport button and a good kick down are a temptation. 
Now, the thought of a fridge in the back armrest for an extra £784 may bring a pained expression to your face, but driving the S320 won't. OK, I admit, I'm not very keen on the American-style parking brake, and neither am I keen on power steering that allows you to go from lock to lock with one finger. But apart from that, it is a special car. It feels as though it's been designed just for you. And if the accountants whinge, well, give in. Perhaps you can do without the Parktronic system and practice your own parking skills. These are cars you spend other people's money on. A company car, perhaps, to go with the other one or two on the drive. If you're in a position to be adding one of these to your lineup, just be careful you know what it says about you. Are you purposeful and understated? Or just big and dull? Not only are the flowers blooming, but the caravans have risen from their winter slumbers and are back on the roads again, loathed by some, but loved by those who've learned the noble art of caravanning. They're fairly easy to handle if you follow a few basic guidelines, but a rash move or an unexpected gust of wind, and it could be curtains. What often happens when a caravan crashes is that it doesn't just dent like a car, it disintegrates. That's why, when you're on the move, the van is definitely not the place for a quick nap. It's also illegal. On a few rare occasions, police videos have captured what happens when it all goes horribly wrong. The weight of this caravan was enough to flip over a heavy off-roader. Fortunately, the occupants got out safely. It's not just caravans. This car and trailer were clocked at 90, travelling just a few feet behind another car. In the distance, the standing traffic, which the driver hasn't seen. But it's not just driving which may cause problems. After a winter's neglect, things can go wrong with the caravan itself. This van was taken in part exchange by a dealer in Lancashire, but needs repair work before it can go back on the road. A cracked gas pipe and faulty electrics were only a few of the problems. If we have a, yeah. a look at the side here. Well, that looks like a perfectly good tyre to me. The, the tread, tread is good. The tread is perfect. Yeah. The side wall of the tyre is, is completely cracked. The steel banding that's built into the tyre, because it's been stood on its wheels for six months, um, over the years, that's collapsed. There's a tyre by the side of you there which we've taken off a caravan that came into service. Oh, gosh. As you can see, the tread's perfect, but because the steel banding's collapsed, <laughs> It's dreadful. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want that on your caravan. So this caravan obviously isn't in a state to go out on the road. It isn't, but this is how it came in. The chap was using it up to the point he brought it in. Amazing. Caravans which are too heavy for the car can also be dangerous. Both these vans are the same length, but only one can be towed safely by the Sierra. Which one? Well, it's the one on the right. That caravan is a quarter of a tonne lighter. Throughout the season, police will be stopping caravans at random to offer a little friendly advice. It's all meant to keep caravanners safe and legal. We're quite concerned that uh, caravans, once they're over, overwintered, aren't serviced before they're taken on the road. And of course, once they're connected to the car, they then become subject to uh, similar regulations that govern the maintenance of motor cars. Out on the roads, the traffic may be hotting up, tempers may be fraying, but caravans, properly serviced, go on and on, relentless. All right, for some. Well, after the break, Mike Rutherford chewing the cud with our good friend Sterling Moss. So, join us then. Hi, welcome back to Four Wheels Good. The racing legend Sterling Moss is one of our regular guests here on Four Wheels, and since the uh, Grand Prix season is in full swing, we thought it'd be a good idea to push Mike Rutherford in the, the general direction of Sterling's luxury Mayfair apartment. Well, we're back in familiar territory, the centre of London, smack bang in the centre of London. Not too many people live around here, but uh, the bloke sitting next to me does. Sterling Moss, of course, our old friend and a regular on the programme. Sterling, since we talked last, the Formula One season has started, had a few races so far. What's the verdict to date? Yeah, no, I think we, we've seen, up till now, we've seen a, 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 quite an interesting race. Uh, particularly, of course, in, in Argentina. I think that the Stuarts have done a lot better than I thought mm. they would. I think he's got together very much better than, than anybody thought of that earlier, mm. I think. 
I think that uh, poor old Damon is still trying hard. I, I think the great thing for Damon is I think he's got a very good backing, I think, because Walkinshaw is a winner, without a doubt. And I think that Damon is much more relaxed. I mm. mean, if you see Damon and, mm. and hear what he's got to say, he's very much more relaxed, even though he isn't being successful yet. Isn't that because it's all over for Damon and uh, yeah, he's well, just it makes sitting it easier, back doesn't it? counting the money? Sure. Yeah, but, but the, yeah, but no. But the point is that I, I think that when the pressure's off him, now we can see his father's type of personality coming forward, which is good because there's no doubt that Damon was nothing like his father, nothing like the sparkle his father had. Mm. And I think now he's beginning to get that sparkle. He's making mm. some very good remarks. Mm. I mean, you didn't see this on television, but uh, the Clive James show, which was on TV, of course, was recorded, and uh, Clive turned to the driver and said, "You must admit, all of you, you know, as a group, you know, that really the man to beat is Schumacher." All of those who agree put their hands up. Well, nobody did, which was pretty bad. But anyway, he then turned to Damon, you see, and he said, well, what do you think makes him so great, Damon? Damon said, uh, $20 million, <laughs> which was a good remark, yeah. you know. But of course, sure. he couldn't show it. It wasn't on the show because it, wasn't sure. that, it was out. But, uh, it's funny. We, we, we started off by saying we were going to talk about the season, and, and the magazines are doing it, the newspapers are doing it. Everybody's still focusing on Damon. To put it into context, during the first three races of the season, at least, he hadn't even finished the race. Yeah. He's, he's qualifying at the, in the bottom half of the field. I find it all a bit embarrassing and a bit sad, actually. I agree, but you see, the point is that it's a good talking point. Damon is a nice bloke. He has Ish. not... No, he is. He's a nice <laughs> bloke, but, he, but he, he hasn't been the sparkling, interesting, slick guy that his dad was. I mean, his mm. father was a very great character mm. he wasn't a great driver but a great character mm. and I think therefore and he's English which of course is important to us and to sort of follow what he's doing has an interest because of who he is or who he's the son of if you like mm. but he is after all I mean he's a pretty quick driver um, and the others aren't doing as well as I think we might have thought I mean Jacques Villeneuve's had a lot of problems hasn't mm. he let's face it mm. more than one would have thought Heinz Harold Frensen is of course is, is disaster mm. at the moment I mean a disaster um, uh, the the um, Benettons have not come through as much as I, I personally thought they would. No. They haven't done. They haven't Lacey's yet. gone off the ball, hasn't he? A Lacey's still got that talent, but yes, I, but I think Gerhard Berger's the smart one. Mm. I mean, he he's smart because he negotiates his own contracts mm. too, you know. And one of the wealthiest blokes, I think, in Formula One. Oh, yeah, be because of that, because mm. he doesn't have to give 20% or a fifth of his income mm. or more away. Mm. And the fact that he's been doing it for a long time as well also kind of helps. Yeah, well, he, he, is, the, he is the father <laughs> of it, I agree, yeah. 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 Coming back to Damon, can you see the situation changing? I mean, for how many for how many years have we heard that Ferrari, for example, were going to turn it round, and we're hearing that TWR Arrows are going to turn it round? Easier said than done, isn't it? Yeah, but I can't help feeling one has to look at the at the, at the foundations of the thing, and there's no doubt Tom Walkinshaw is a winner. The things that Tom has done, he's rather like Bernie Eccleston, he's a winner as well, and I think that uh, I think he will turn it round. I really do. I think he's Tom Walkinshaw talent. being the boss of, of, of TWR. Uh, TWR, exactly. Yeah, and uh, I think, and and there's no doubt in my mind that that Damon has got very considerable talent. I don't think he's the best, but he does have a lot of talent, mm. and I think when you put that talent, a relaxed talent, which he's becoming now, together with Tom. Uh, I think he'll get it together. Obviously, it's possible the Yamaha engine won't 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 uh, give out the power. That it, but it seemed to me that now and again it does go quite quickly. It's the reliability that's the problem, yeah, isn't it? At the moment, there's, yeah. there's now talk about perhaps TWR doing some kind of deal with Honda uh, for future seasons. That's one theory I yeah. read, and a theory of mine which I haven't read anywhere, but I don't see why it couldn't happen. Tom Walkinshaw, TWR, of course, build the new Volvo C70 yeah. Coupe in Sweden. Very nice. They've had a lot of success with the uh, uh, Volvo touring car team. Uh, Volvo is a company that's going places, really trying to change their image. What better, what better scenario than Volvo to say, we're going to get into Formula One and we're going to do it through our friend and partner and uh, Walkinshaw. F1 old hand, Tom Walkinshaw. Oh, sure. Could but, Tom's, work, but Tom's got his finger in every pie, hasn't he? I mean, yep. Aston's and Ford, and I mean, you name it. He was with Rover, uh, Audi, uh, all sorts of people. You don't think he's got too many balls in the air? I mean, I just wonder how much time he can concentrate on each of his extensive businesses. Well, frankly, I always think he's England's answer to Roger Penske, and Penske, mm. of course, is, is a great man in America. Can we correct that? Scotland's, Britain's, not England's. He's a Scot. You'll um, be offended by that. I'm sorry about you that. You know what they're like up yeah, there. Well, I suppose you're no right. No offence meant. I, I, yes, I, yes. And chap right. But, uh, but <laughs> no, <laughs> that would just stop but, all the letters coming in. Still, yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm glad you did that. Yes, yes, I've got too many, too many to answer. <laughs> That's true. No, but I, I think he's, he's, 
Scotland's answer, as you say, or the UK's answer. The UK's answer. Yeah, the UK's answer <laughs> to Roger Penske, who, of course, is, 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 yeah. has bought up Hertz and God knows what yeah. else. And he, he is a, a remarkable man. Mm. He's got so many balls in the air. He's got mm. like $3 billion or something in turnover a year. Mm. And I think Uncle Tom's that type. And I, yeah. think he, I think he is a clever man. He picks the right people, obviously. Mm. I think that's one of the things, mm. is that if you are really clever, you know who to pick and mm. delegate. I can't do that. Mm. I won't delegate. I try to do it myself, mm. and which I think is wrong. Okay. And when you get that big, of course, you can't. But he might have made the most expensive mistake of his life, might he, by paying Damon all this money? Because it seems to me that you're paying a man to do a job that he yeah. can't really do. But you don't think he paid that money, do you? Well, a theory Out of I his heard. pocket? Well, uh, but I see what you mean. It's coming from the sponsors. Sponsor, sure. But maybe he could have spent that money on, on engine development or something rather than put it in Damon's pocket. Yes, but The yes. other theory I've heard is that Damon is being paid nothing as like the sort of salary he would have you believe. There's a cosy little agreement that's between Tom and Damon and they're, they're happy for the world to think that Damon's earning millions, but in fact maybe he's only picking up one million, so only. <laughs> it's an awful lot of money still. Uh, yeah, well, that could be true. That could be, I mean... Uh... There's no doubt that the, Tom Walker is a clever guy, and I don't think that Damon's any fool either. And uh, I think he's had things haven't been handled that well, too well, by his manager actually in the past. And mm. maybe Damon's doing it himself. I don't know. I haven't heard that story. It's a good one. It's mm. a possible one. Mm. I mean, you know, in order. He's on the breadline with a million, and if if it really gets going, then you come, we kick him with the big money. Yeah, and yeah. and also it mean you know it's not in Damon's interest, is it, to to be out on the market as a sort of million pound a year driver? He wants to be perceived on the market as a three, four, five million pound a year driver. Yeah, and of course he may well be looking for a job next year. Uh, and on that point, uh, I've got a feeling that he might team up with him and Berger. You know, always have nice things to say about each other. Have you ever noticed that? Berger's always complimenting yes. Damon. Whenever I've tried to get Gerhard to rubbish Damon, he's never done it. He's always had a lot of good things to yeah, say about Yeah, but Gerhard, I think, is a bit of a gentleman anyway. Yeah. I don't think he'd be inclined to rubbish any driver um, who, was, who wasn't rubbish. I mean, I think Damon isn't the sort of driver that one would enjoy rubbishing, I don't no. think. I mean, there are a few I can think of that you would. Uh, yeah. You would, certainly. <laughs> but now Damon has said that he thinks Gerhard is going to win the 1997 Formula One season. I think that's a bit over-optimistic. That's what he said. I mean, I'm not sure if he meant it half-jokingly. I think what, he, what, he, what would have hurt him to say was that either Schumacher or Villeneuve were going yes, to win. It would, actually, yes. it would actually cause him anxiety to say that for obvious reasons. Um, so maybe he was, he was saying it tongue-in-cheek. And Flavio Briatore, the boss of Benetton, has in the past expressed an interest in Damon, I think. And, uh, yeah. of course, our old friend Jean Alesi is not exactly doing himself any favours at Benetton. So it, everything yeah. falls into place again, doesn't it? Yeah, it could be. But we've got this year to take care of before we get into next year. Absolutely. Yeah. And so, come on, prediction time. I don't reckon Damon is going to get more than 10 points all season. Can't no, see but, but, No, but if, he, if Damon can get into the winner's circle, which is a possible at the very end, a possible, then I think he will have, uh, it'll be pretty good. All right, we'll see. All right. Well, we'll have more from Sterling in future weeks and we'll also be meeting up with him and lots of other personalities at this year's Goodwood Festival of Speed, which is on the must-do schedule for this June. Pickup trucks are America's two top-selling models, but the customisers are already doing a roaring trade. I think that the truck uh, has become the, become the multi-purpose vehicle that uh, we always wanted it to be. I think that it's... Uh, much more car-like and much more comfortable than it ever has been in the past and uh, has all the power and the ability of, of what uh, the American public's looking for. Is it a male-dominated market? Not as much as it used to be. And, and, and uh, not only is it not just a male-dominated marketplace, but it's also a much wider marketplace than it was in the past. Our, our uh, demographics, the, the, the younger kids are definitely looking for the full-size truck now, uh, and the older group, it's come to be the thing to have. It, what do people want? Say they buy a new truck, they want to make it suit themselves. I think the uh, best signature to any vehicle is, is in uh, the tire and wheel combination. Also, the stance of the truck. Uh, suspension has become a, a great part of not in just how the truck handles, but how the truck looks with the suspension. Uh, Interior-wise, uh, consoles, custom seats as we're sitting on now, uh, that all match the factory fabric interior. 
uh, steering wheels are, are very, uh, very high profile steering wheels now. Grills are, in, are, are extremely popular in the front of the truck and, and where they've literally just enhanced the actual look of the truck itself, but put a street rod type billet aluminum grill in it, uh, air dams, driving lights, uh, it, it just goes on and on and on. 50% of the vehicles on your streets will be trucks. Well, the, the, actually, it's, it's documented for, what, for whatever that's worth, but uh, we definitely feel that we're in the proper position. Uh, they do feel one out of two in every driveway will, will be a pickup truck sport utility vehicle of some kind, and, and uh, we think all the reasons uh, that we're in business here is why they're favoring it. The factory is, are, are having more success with the more powerful, with the multi-purpose vehicles, and a pickup truck is becoming a multi-purpose vehicle. But Tim Susamian is already working on the next trend after the customised pickup. This Chevy estate, a sheep in wolf's clothing, is the leading edge of Californian car fashion yet to come. Uh, what we have here next to us is, is the latest station wagon that General Motors has come out with, only with a little twist. And uh, we really like the body lines of it, but by the time they get done putting the mouldings and the, and the hubcaps and what have you and making it for the general public, it kind of loses the fact of what a beautifully shaped car it is. And so what we've done here is, is take, uh, uh, take it one step farther, so to speak, and make a hot rod out of the station wagon. Well, that's all for this week. From all of us here on Four Wheels, goodbye.